Welcome to the Snoozecast, the podcast designed to help you fall asleep. On the Snoozecast, we read excerpts from public domain works and occasionally original stories. We'd like to thank our listeners. If you enjoy our show, please be sure to subscribe and also share it with a friend. The Snoozecast is meant to be played as you get into bed. As a result, the best place to listen to us is on our website, snoozecast.com. From there, you'll be able to download or play single episodes without having to change any autoplay settings on your device or in your podcast directory. This episode is brought to you by A Campfire at Dusk. Tonight, I'll be reading an excerpt from My Robin by Francis Hodgson Burnett, originally published in 1912. Burnett was an American English novelist and playwright. She is perhaps best known for her children's stories, in particular, The Secret Garden. My Robin is a charming anecdote that further expands upon the Robin featured in The Secret Garden. Let's get cozy. Close your eyes. Relax your body into the softness of your bed. Now, take a few deep breaths. There came to me among the letters I received last spring one which touched me very closely. It was a letter full of delightful things, but the delightful thing which so reached my soul was a question. The writer had been reading The Secret Garden, and her question was this. Did you own the original of the robin? He could not have been a mere creature of fantasy. I feel sure you owned him. I was thrilled to the center of my being. Here was someone who plainly had been intimate with robins. English Robins. I wrote and explained as far as one could in a letter what I am now going to relate in detail. I did not own the Robin. He owned me. Or perhaps we owned each other. He was an English Robin, and he was a person, not a mere bird. An English Robin differs greatly from the American one. He is much smaller and quite differently shaped. His body is daintily round and plump. His legs are delicately slender. He is a graceful little patrician with an astonishing allurement of bearing. His eye is large and dark and dewy. He wears a tight little red satin waistcoat on his full round breast, and every tilt of his head, every flirt of his wing, is instinct with dramatic significance. He is fascinatingly conceited. He burns with curiosity. He is determined to engage in social relations at almost any cost, and his raging jealousy of attention paid to less worthy objects than himself drives him at times to efforts to charm and distract which are irresistible. An intimacy with a robin, an English robin, is a liberal education. This particular one I knew in my rose garden in Kent. I feel sure he was born there, and for a summer at least believed it to be the world. It was a lovesome, mystic place, shut in partly by old red brick walls against which fruit trees were trained, and partly by a laurel hedge with a wood behind it. It was my habit to sit and write there under an aged, writhen tree, gray with lichen and festooned with roses. The soft silence of it, the remote aloofness, were the most perfect ever dreamed of. But let me not be led astray by the garden, I must be firm and confine myself to the robin. The garden shall be another story. There were so many people in this garden, people with feathers or fur, who, because I sat so quietly, did not mind me in the least. That it was not a surprising thing when I looked up one summer morning to see a small bird hopping about the grass a yard or so away from me. The surprise was not that he was there, but he stayed there. Or rather, he continued to hop, with short, reflective-looking hope. While hopping, he looked at me, not in a furtive, flighty way, but rather as a person might tentatively regard a very new acquaintance. 
The absolute truth of the matter, I had reason to believe later, was that he did not know I was a person. I may have been the first of my species he had seen in this rose garden world of his, and he thought I was only another kind of robin. I was, too, though that was a secret of mine, and nobody but myself knew it. Because of this fact, I had the power of holding myself still, quite still, and filling myself with softly alluring tenderness of the tenderness when any little wild thing came near me. "'What do you do to make him come to you like that?' someone asked me a month or so later. "'What do you do?' "'I don't know what I do exactly,' I said, "'except that I hold myself very still and I feel like a robin.'" You can only do that with a tiny wild thing by being so tender of him, of his little timidities and feelings, so adoringly anxious not to startle him or suggest by any movement the possibility of your being a creature who could hurt, that your very yearning to understand his tiny hopes and fears and desires makes you for the time cease to be quite a mere human thing and gives you another and more exquisite sense which speaks for you without speech. As I sat and watched him, I held myself softly still and felt just that. I did not know he was a robin. The truth was that he was too young at the time to look like one, but I did not know that either. He was plainly not a thrush, or a linnet, or a sparrow, or a starling, or a blackbird. He was a little indeterminate colored bird and he had no red on his breast. And as I sat and gazed at him, he gazed at me as one quite without prejudice unless it might be with the slightness tinge of favor, and hopped, and hopped, and hopped. That was the thrill and wonder of it. No bird, however, evident his acknowledgment of my harmlessness, had ever hopped and remained. Many had perched for a moment in the grass or on a nearby bow, had trilled or chirped or secured a scurrying golden green beetle and flown away. But none had stayed to inquire, to reflect, even to seem, if one dared be so bold as to hope such a thing, to make mysterious, almost occult advances towards intimacy. Also, I had never before heard of such a thing happening to anyone howsoever bird-loving. Birds are creatures who must be wooed, and it must be delicate and careful wooing which allures them into friendship. I held my soft stillness. Would he stay? Could it be that the last hop was nearer? Yes, it was. The moment was a breathless one. Dare one believe that the next was nearer still, and the next, and the next and that the two yards of distance had become scarcely one, and that within that radius he was soberly hopping around my very feet with his quite unafraid eye full upon me. This was what was happening. It may not seem exciting, but it was. That a little wild thing should come to one unasked was of a thrillingness touched with awe. Without stirring a muscle, I began to make low, soft little sounds to him, very low and very caressing indeed, softer than one makes to a baby. I wanted to weave a spell, to establish mental communication, to make magic. And as I uttered the tiny sounds, he hopped nearer and nearer. Oh, to think that you will come as near as that, I whispered to him. You know. You know that nothing in the world would make me put out my hand or startle you in the least tiniest way. You know it because you are a real person, as well as a lovely, lovely little bird thing. You know it because you are a soul. Because of this first morning I knew, years later, that this was what Mistress Mary thought when she bent down in the long walk and tried to make the robin sounds. I said it all in a whisper and I think the words must have sounded like robin sounds, because he listened with interest, and at last, miracle of miracles, as it seemed to me, he actually fluttered up onto a small shrub not two yards away from my knee, and sat there as one who was pleased with the topic of conversation. 
I did not move, of course. I sat still and waited his pleasure. Not for mines of rubies would I have lifted a finger. I think he stayed near me altogether about half an hour. Then he disappeared. Where or even exactly when, I did not know. One moment he was hopping among some of the rose bushes, and then he was gone. This, in fact, was his little mysterious way from first to last. Through all the months of our delicious intimacy, he never let me know where he lived. I knew it was in the rose garden, but that was all. His extraordinary freedom was something to think over. After reflecting upon him a good deal, I thought I had reached an explanation. He had been born in the rose garden, and being of a home-loving nature, he had declined to follow the rest of his family when they had made their first flight over the wall, into the rose walk, or over the laurel hedge, into the peasant cover behind. He had stayed in the rose world, and then had felt lonely. Without father or mother or sisters or brothers, desolateness of spirit fell upon him. He saw a creature. I insist on believing that he thought it another order of Robin, and approached to see what it would say. Its whole bearing was confidence-inspiring. It made softly alluring, if unexplainable, sounds. He felt its friendliness and affection. It was curious to look at, and far too large for any ordinary nest. It plainly could not fly, but there was not a shadow of sentiment in it. Instinct told him that. It admired him. It wanted him to remain near. There was a certain comfort in its caressing atmosphere. He liked it and felt less desolate. He would return to it again. The next summer, rains keep me in the house. The next, I went to the rose garden in the morning and sat down under my tree to work. I had not been there half an hour when I felt I must lift my eyes and look. A little indeterminate colored bird was hopping quietly about in the grass, quite aware of me as his dew-bright eye manifested. He had come again, of intention, because we were mates. It was the beginning of an intimacy not to be described unless one filled a small volume. From that moment, we never doubted each other for one second. He knew, and I knew. Each morning, when I came into the rose garden, he came to call on me and discover things he wanted to know concerning robins of my size and unusual physical conformation. He did not understand, but he was attracted by me. Each day, I held myself still and tried to make Robin sounds expressive of adoring tenderness, and he came each day a little nearer. At last arrived a day when, as I softly left my seat and moved about the garden, he actually quietly hopped after me. I wish I could remember exactly what length of time elapsed before I knew he was really a robin. An ornithologist would doubtless know, but I do not. But one morning, I was bending over a bed of Lorette Mesme roses, and I became aware that he had arrived in his usual mysterious way, without warning. He was standing in the grass, and when I turned my eyes upon him, I only just saved myself from starting, which would have meant disaster. I saw upon his breast the first dawning of a flush of color, more tawny than actual red at that stage, but it hinted at revelations. Further subterfuge is useless, I said to him. You are betrayed. You are a robin. And he did not attempt to deny it either then or at any future time. 
In less than two weeks, he revealed the tight, glossy, little bright red satin waistcoat, and with it, a certain youthful maturity such as one beholds in the wearer of a first dress suit. His movements were more brisk and certain. He began to make little flights and little sounds, though for some time he made no attempt to sing. Instead of appearing suddenly in the grass at my feet, a heavenly little rush of wings would bring him to a bow over my head or a twig quite near me, where he would tilt daintily. Taking his silent but quite responsive part in the conversations, which always took place between us, it was I who talked, telling him how I loved him, how satin red his waistcoat was, how large and bright his eyes, how delicate and elegant his slender legs. I flattered him a great deal. He adored flattery, and I am sure he loved me most when I told him that it was impossible to say anything which could flatter him. It gave him confidence in my good taste. One morning, a heavenly sunny one, I was conversing with him by the Loret Missimis again, and he was evidently much pleased with the things I said. Perhaps he liked my hat, which was a large white one, with a wreath of roses round its crown. I saw him look at it, and I gently hinted that I had worn it in the hope that he would approve. I had broken off a handful of coral pink lorettes and was arranging them idly when he spread his wings in a sudden upward flight, a tiny swift flight which ended among the roses on my hat, the very hat on my head. Did I make myself still then? Did I stir? By a single hairbreadth? Who does not know? I scarcely let myself breathe. I could not believe that such a thing of pure joy could be true. But in a minute, I realized that he at least was not afraid to move. He was perfectly at home. He hopped about the brim and examined the roses with delicate pecks. That I was under the hat apparently only gave him confidence. He knew me as well as that. He stayed until he had learned all he wished to know about garden hats. And then he lightly flew away. From that time, each day drew us closer to each other. He began to perch on twigs only a few inches from my face and listen while I whispered to him. Yes, he listened and made answer with chirps. Nothing else would describe it. As I wrote, he would alight on my manuscript paper and try to read. Sometimes I thought he was a little offended because he found my handwriting so bad that he could not understand it. He would take crumbs out of my hand. He would alight on my chair or my shoulder. The instant I opened the little door in the leaf-covered garden wall, I would be greeted by the darling little rush of wings, and he was beside me and he always came home from nowhere and disappeared.